All right, so welcome everybody to today's session of the Cardiff Analysis Seminar. It's the last one before Easter. So we'll then skip a few weeks and we'll be back on the 25th of April. Um, <clears throat> today we are in person, as you can see. Um, and we are delighted to have Arianna Giunti from uh, Imperial College London, who will talk about homogenization in randomly perforated domains. So thank you very much for accepting your invitation and over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matteo, for the introduction. Thanks to Matteo and the organizers for the invitation and everyone here and online for attending. So it's really a pleasure to be here in Cardiff and speaking in person. So it's one of the <laughs> first times back after the pandemic. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, as the title say, is a homogenization result. And it's in randomly perforated domain. So for those of you who are a bit familiar with homogenization, this means that the heterogeneity of the microstructure is not as in many uh, classical examples in the coefficients, but it will be mostly in the geometry where certain partial differential equations are solved. Let me also say and mention that uh, the work, I mean, the results I'm going to present are joint works with uh, Juan Velázquez from the University of Bonn and uh, Richard Höfer from Paris 6. Uh, so let's start. So the, we are mainly interested in certain boundary value problems, which have the form that you see above on the slide. So as you see here, uh, the operator L will be an elliptic operator. You can think about it being the Laplacian or the Stokes operator. In most of the talks, for simplicity, just think about it as the Laplacian. And throughout the talk, I would comment when for Stokes problems, this is different or there are kind of like particular challenges. So as you see here, we are solving it in a certain domain, the epsilon, with Dirichlet boundary conditions. And this, the epsilon is what one calls a punctured domain. So basically what you see in blue in the slide. So this means that we are taking a certain open bounded domain D and from it, we remove a certain collection of holes, which in the slide are called H epsilon. So the parameter epsilon, which is the typical length scale of the microscopic structure, um, characterizes, let's say, the set of, of holes as follows. So basically I call epsilon the typical distance between the holes. So it would be epsilon, the distance between the red dots in the figure. And then I call A epsilon. So this is a parameter which is enslaved to epsilon. By simplicity, think about it as a certain algebraic power of epsilon. And this would be the typical size and diameter of each hole. So basically my solution new epsilon is, depends on epsilon because I'm solving this problem in a domain which has many holes, again, having distance, epsilon and having size usually smaller, which is, let's say, epsilon to the alpha. So uh, usually these kind of problems arise uh, when you want to, store for it, to study, for instance, uh, fluid flows through certain media. If you consider in the equation a Stokes equation in particular, what you want to do sometimes is you want to study, let's say, in the easy case, water flowing through a porous medium through sand. And therefore, what you usually want to model is the flow of a certain viscous incompressible fluid and the grains of the sand around which your water should flow are basically the holes in the domain. To be more precise, since the holes that I'm considering are very separated, uh, for those of you who are more interested into the physical interpretation, the problem that I'm presenting um, arises mostly when you have, for instance, sedimenting particles. So you have particles which are falling with a constant velocity in a fluid, and, you, and the fluid usually goes faster than the sedimenting velocity. So the approximation problem would be a problem like the one on top of the slide. So as you might imagine, thinking about this application, right, water through sand, the grains of sand are very small. So if I want to describe usually the flow of water on a certain length scale, this length scale usually is much bigger than every single grain of sand. So 
what one wants to do is a homogenization problem. So one is interested in what is the effective behavior of this problem in the limits of many small holes. So when I send epsilon to zero, so this means that I'm making, uh, I'm introducing more and more particles because I'm putting as, dis as distance epsilon and also smaller and smaller because my diameter is also going to zero. So, and this is like something that, I mean, again, to, 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 to continue on the analogy or on the physical interpretation, that would be the problem when you want to study the flow of this fluid. And of course, it, it is very, very hard, right, to be able to describe the grains of sand around which the fluid should flow. But thanks, I mean, luckily, homogenization tells you that if you're interested in the fluid flowing on distances which are bigger, much bigger, than the grains of the sand, you don't need to describe so thoroughly the geometry. So you don't need exactly to solve a problem in a punctured domain, but in many cases in the limit, so the effective behavior would be a new problem that you see here, and which is a simpler problem in the sense that you see the holes do disappear. So this is like, what I will be talking about would be the mathematical, the rigorous proof in certain settings of this uh, convergence. Of course, I still, I mean, there are still many questions and the first natural ones are of course, what does this mean? So which kind of convergence we have? When does it happen? So which kind of um, assumptions should I put on my holes? Which kind of regimes, because here I'm, being extremely general in some sense. I'm just telling you that the diameter should depend on epsilon in some sense, but I didn't make it precise. And of course, what is L hat here, right? Because I haven't defined it yet. So, and in principle, what one could expect is that according to the different regimes, I might have a different kind of limit or homogenized operator. So before telling, I mean, going more into detail, let me uh, tell you immediately that what we will be interested in is the case of disordered media. For instance, thinking again about the case of a fluid flowing through a porous medium, especially in nature, it's very realistic to assume that the holes are not periodically distributed. Uh, and usually what you have are mostly statistical information on how they are distributed on their size, on their uh, separation. And therefore, what you want to use in some of these problems are media which are random. So holes which are randomly distributed and therefore maybe pictures which are a bit more different and less regular than the one on the slide. Okay, um, right. So let me just go back for a moment. So when one like first naively tries to answer this question, here, especially the second one. Of course, I mean, one asks oneself which kind of geometric properties uh, are playing a role into the homogenization process. For instance, is it the geometry or the shape of the hole? Is it the volume ratio, so the amount of volume which is occupied by the holes, or is it something else? So it turns out that for this kind of problems, the main quantity which governs the homogenization behavior is the capacity. So it's a notion of capacity, uh, which at least for the Laplacian, I will comment on Stokes later, is what is usually the standard electrostatic or harmonic capacity. So just to remind people, when I say capacity, at least for two sets which are nested into each other, and which are, let's say, regular enough, what the capacity of a set A into a set B means that we are minimizing the Dirichlet energy on the slide above here on functions which are basically zero on the boundary of B and are at least one on the set A. So what do I mean that the capacity governs the behavior? Well, if I'm able, heuristically, roughly speaking, let's say two, give a notion of limit of capacity density. So what am I doing here? I'm taking a set, any set in my domain D. I'm looking at 
the holes which are inside this set. I'm looking at the capacity which is generated by these holes and I take the limit. And I try to see what happens. So if I'm able to say that this limit exists and it defines a notion of measure on my set A, then heuristically my homogenized operator is something like you see here. So if I start with the Laplacian, in the limit, I have holes disappearing and the unique memory of the holes in the problem appears into this massive or zeroth order term in the equation. So more precisely, this means that if I'm able to give a meaning to this measure mu in general and to this space, when I'm, I mean, in most of the results that I'm talking about is just a constant. So, I mean, maybe this is a bit of an overkill, uh, but in general, you can assume uh, fewer regularity, let's say. So what you have indeed is that the solutions of the Laplacian problem in the puncture domain converge to this problem here. Similarly, you can also think about having the density of capacity mu not, I mean, having a limit, so the limit exists, but it blows up with a certain order. Also in that case, if mu tends to plus infinity, if you look at this heuristics, what this tells you is that if this is exploding, if I'm able to rescale the problem, the Laplacian will disappear. So the limit problem, there is again a homogenization problem, which solves now this much, much simpler equation in some sense. So this is just new UH equal to the right hand side. So, and again, let me, I will give more details. And of course, please ask me if you're interested, but you need to rescale the solution, of course, because that term is exploded. So basically, so as you see here, I mean, if I'm able to give a meaning to this density of capacity, I should expect to have an effective problem. Similar story for Stokes. Here we have a kind of different notion of capacity. Um, I'm happy to comment on this later, but you should just think about it as the same capacity above, but for vector fields, because now we are vectorial, with an additional constraint, which is the fact that you need to be divergence free. But besides that, you are still able with a similar, in a similar way, to give a meaning to the density of capacity, which is now, we are in vectorial, so it's now a matrix. And again, as you see here, this is exactly the same story above. So if M, my limit is finite, I pass from just the Stokes operator to the Stokes operator plus another zero order term. This is usually called in the literature Brinkman system. And again, similarly, if my M blows up, suitably rescale, my solution converge to this equation here which in physics is what is called Darcy's law. So it's the case of the fluid where the velocity is basically proportional to the gradient of the, of the pressure. So takeaway message in all this slide is if I want to hope to have an homogenization problem, I need to study the density of capacity, which is generated by the obstacles. So as you see here, I mean, uh, there, are a lot, there are a lot of references and there are even more. Uh, however, what, and, and let's say, let me say this reference, I mean, these results, they study and prove rigorous homogenization for obstacles which are periodic and random. However, in all this works, there is a very strong assumption on the length scales. Let me be more precise. So in the previous slide, I said that epsilon and this a epsilon are the typical length scales. Of course, this is a very general definition. Actually, it's not even a definition. So it depends what you mean by that. So in all these works, typical means it is the length scale. So in all these works, you need to assume basically that epsilon is the distance between the, is the minimal and maximal distance between the holes and that A epsilon is the length scale of the diameter of the holes. So you do not allow for 
these length scales to, to be broken in some sense. You do not allow, for instance, for clustering. You do not allow for obstacles which are maybe a bit bigger and therefore start creating chains. However, there are many cases where you might have a structure which is not so rigid, but for which you still preserve the capacity. So the question is, do, is it really the capacity which governs the homogenization behavior? Can we remove all these very rigid assumptions on the distribution of the obstacles? Also, because if you think about it in many random settings, it's a bit unrealistic to assume that there are no obstacles which get close to each other, that the size being random cannot become a bit bigger than what you would like to be. And this is basically what I'm going to present today and the result that I will talk about. So let me give you a bit of a heuristics first on the different, let's say, regimes and how you should choose, let's say, the scales of the distance and the diameter. So this is the periodic case. So the picture on the slide that you see is poles which are periodically distributed. Uh, epsilon is the distance, right? So it's basically the epsilon lattice. For the centers and the size of the holes is epsilon to the alpha. So periodic case is very simple, right? It means that I'm basically generating holes by picking uh, centers on the lattice, let me use that too, uh, rescaling them so that the distance is epsilon, taking radii which are scale like epsilon to the alpha. So just one reminder. Just remember that in dimension three, the capacity of a ball scales like the radius. And this is a very trivial observation. So if I look at the number of holes which fall, for instance, in a unitary cube or in any kind of domain of size one, that scales like epsilon to the minus three. So keeping this in mind, we can try to see what we can say about this object, right? This was the object for which we wanted to take the limit and see whether we had a limit density of capacity. So what is this object? So this is, I'm basically taking the capacity of the holes which fall inside a unitary cube, basically like a one slide. So this is just a union basically of centers which are in this set here. Right, the so center for which the risk scale falls, falls inside the cube of balls. And now we use something about the capacity, the capacity subadditive. So if I take the capacity of a union of sets, I can always bound it by the sum of the single capacities. Now, believe me, from above. From above. Now, believe me, the fact that in many cases, at least for alpha bigger than one, the relative distance between holes is becoming bigger and bigger because the, 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 the size scales like epsilon to the power which is more than one. This is a bound from above, but it becomes also an equality. So in other words, you can say that the capacity of the sets decorrelate. In some sense. So now we have this nice identity. Now we are saying that this is basically just the sum of capacities of balls. But we know what a capacity of a ball is. It's just scaling like the radius. So this is the radius times the number of the holes in this uh, cube. So as you see here, we immediately get a feeling of the scaling that we need. So if we want mu, because we needed to take the limit of this to be finite, we need to match these two powers. So alpha equal to three. If alpha is smaller than three, then we expect that this will open. So again, I mean, by this, let's say, heuristics in the periodic case, one sees what, what is the power of alpha that I need to, to check or that I expect in order to have a Brinkman law or a Darcy's law. So Brinkman, finite, so Stokes or Laplace and plus the zero order term. Darcy is the case where things blow up, so the second order operator vanishes basically. 
Now, let's introduce the model. Of course, it's nothing particularly original. So one way of introducing or defining a random model would be generalizing the periodic one in the following way. So I take now a union of centers which are randomly distributed. Think, for instance, by simplicity in this talk uh, as phi being a Poisson point process. And here the radii are random variables as well. So again, by simplicity, we assume them to be IID, so independent, identically distributed, satisfying this moment bound. And I will comment on this in the next slide. But I already like have you noticed that in one of the cases, like the critical case, the one where the density of capacity is finite, alpha is equal to three. So I'm only assuming that the first moment is bounded. So this is a very low stochastic integrability assumption. Indeed, in some sense, if you see here, the average radius of the holes is just the expectation, right? So that's like this. And of course, this is like, in order to have that at least the average radius is fine, and you need to assume that the first moment is bound. You can do less, but this tells you that your random variable can be really unbounded. So, in the, for this kind of model, and this I will I will try to comment on this more in the in the next slide. Let me just like have you noticed that we respect the typical length scales in average, in the sense that the average radius scales like epsilon to the alpha, the average distance scales like epsilon. But this is far away from having a nice drawing like the one. So let me elaborate more on this in the next slide. Just let's remember the random uh, holes. I will focus on the critical case because it's kind of the nicest one in some sense. Uh, and also because the other ones, they, 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 they work in a similar way. So the critical case was indeed alpha equal to three. So the radii, are of order epsilon to the three. So this is like uh, just to record the assumptions. One observation, right? Because now we said that the average quantities are in the right uh, order or the right length scales. So what can I say about the density of the capacity in this random case? What I can try to do is to do exactly the same calculation of the periodic case. So I fix a realization on my random holes and I do exactly what I did in the previous slides. So I have a cube, I look at the holes inside the cube and I look at their capacity. Now here I do exactly what I did in the previous slide. So of course you have to believe me, but you can show that Again, this is a union of different holes, or sorry, of different holes, and you can approximate it using a subadditivity by the sum of the capacities. But now the sum of the capacities, so the sum is this one, right? I'm summing over the centers which fall into the cube, and the capacities scale like the radius, and the radius is epsilon three rho z, so epsilon three rho z. So what you see there is ID random variable, the sum of ID random variables, and I'm summing basically epsilon to the minus two. So this is just an average sum of ID random variables. And the strong law of large numbers tells you that this converges to the average. So what this tells you is that even if the assumption on the radii is very low, the capacity for every realization, so not only in average, is finite in the limit. Right? This is like for almost every realization. It's not even, um, let's say, a, a convergence in the uh, in probability or measure or in expectation. Now we have an equality, right? Or not a... No, you can prove that it's. Uh, yes. When they, when they yes. I will try to 
to comment more on this later because exactly that's the, the, the point is that you have to show that what you just said doesn't break things down. Right, so let me again mention that this is nice, right? That's what should tell us that homogenization should hold. However, we are very far from having poles which are separate. You can say by a similar, by strong low large numbers kind of uh, arguments that if you look at the number of poles which are overlapping, right? So where we have kind of chains, the order is basically epsilon to the minus one over epsilon to the minus three poles. So things happen. So this is what I said. So, okay, right. So basically that's the model. So it's a random model. We have random centers, random radii, and we assume a very low stochastic integrability. Actually the minimum one such that the density of capacity converges, so it's finite. But that's far away from telling you that I don't have clustering. In the next slide, I will give you the result, and then I will pass on to the blackboard and try to give a bit more flavor of what are the arguments behind this. So, first result, I mean, it's indeed like it's nothing like particularly, let's say, uh, surprising in terms of formulation. It's just basically the random version of the homogenization theory. So, if I have poles which are distributed, like in the previous slides, for almost every realization, I have a convergence of my solutions for the Laplacian problem to the equation that we expect, because that's exactly the um, quantity which uh, represents the finite density of capacity. Same thing, let me mention, holds for Stokes. So same results, Holds in the case in the vectorial case, uh, and these results, I mean, these two results are uh, or three results are only qualitative, and one can do something at least start doing something in the quantitative sense. So one can prove some convergence rates for these uh, problems. And then there is another regime, which was the one that I didn't mention too much, but is the one where the density of capacity blows up. So the Laplacian, in other words, if you rescale the solutions as here, which is the order in which we blow up basically, we converge to this kind of trivial equation here. Uh, and the same holds for the case of Stokes, so Darcy's law. Again, for this models of random distributed holes where we do not have assumptions which prevent clustering. Okay, so maybe I can stop for a moment if there are questions and then continue trying to give a bit of a flavor and the main ideas which come into work in the proof and try and be like to show how capacity does not create problems when you have plus one. Um, I'll pay close to one, I guess there is, you cannot use capacity anymore. So when I'll pay equal to one, is a kind of very different problem because you have uh, only one scale. You can use capacity, but um, so in some sense, so here would be to the, the, the limit cell problem or the limit, um, yes, the, the limit cell problem, let's say that gives you this, this uh, term is something of this form. So is I have my obstacles let's say that it is with scale to one, and I'm studying, at, I'm studying an equation for these obstacles in the full space. So basically not three around this obstacle. In the case that you said, it's different because now the holes do not decorrelate. So you might, for instance, in the periodic case, you have a cell problem, which is in the cell. For the random case, is a more complex and you have to do this kind of lifting to probability, define it there. So you, you kind of have homogenization character for the integral. Yes. But still in the probability Exactly. So you still, so in the case epsilon equal to one, you still have this result here. So there is a paper by Kozlov and Beliaev, I think it was quite a while ago, where you prove that you have convergence. So it's, but it's not given by capacity, but sometimes. Exactly. 
it's a different yeah exactly it's a, Okay, so maybe I continue on the blackboard. Should I? Yeah. <laughs> Marco did it. Some switching. Okay, so, so okay. So let me give a, a bit of a sketch of the proof. So let me remind that I, mean, I will talk about the Laplacian and then I will comment on Stokes. And of course, I'm happy to give more details on Stokes. Uh, to anyone who was who was interested in it. So remember, this is my set, each epsilon, and this was a union of centers which are random, poles which are scaled by epsilon three. Okay, so let's say that we want to prove the theorem, right? We want to prove that under the conditions, like this maybe. I do have a convergence of this, this problem. So the first thing that one does and that one always does when tries <laughs> to prove this convergence is to try to find some compactness. So in this case, compactness really comes for free, just by the fact that my solution u epsilon is in the right space, H10 in this domain. I can test the equation with the solution itself, and I get the energy estimate. So by the energy estimate and Poincare, they I get immediately that this is up to a constant, uniformly bounded. Of course, I'm assuming that I think we have toward the right uh, space, but so that's what I have. And therefore, this tells me that at least up to subsequences, I have a limit, a weak limit in H1 D. Uh, of course, I have first the um, inequality in the puncture domain. But my function u is defined by zero in the whole. So I can just use the trivial extension in the full d and work in h10 d. So I have this. And now the question is, of course, how do I use, as usual, right? I mean, now I have a candidate limit. How do I use the fact that u epsilon is solving my equation to extract information on this? So here comes one basic, I mean, trivial problem. And it's the fact that I can, I mean, when epsilon changes, I have different domains because my holes are changing. The domains are not nested into each other. So there is no trivial or easy relationship between the different admissible test function spaces, right? So, so when epsilon changes, I don't have an easy relationship between the different spaces here. So this makes, of course, hard to find a good text, text function in a good space, which is admissible for all epsilon, test the equation with the test function and pass to the limit. So what do I do? Well, something which is very intuitive. So what I want to do is to Start with something which is a test function in the final space. Let's even say better. Infinity zero and D. 
And I want to make it in some sense by a certain transformation, an admissible test function in the heterogeneous problem. So how do I try to make this transformation? One of the easiest way is by this, what is called in the literature, oscillating test function method. So it is, okay, I want a function which is in this space. So first of all, is zero in the whole. So I try to define the transformation by a product. So I say, I modify my test function rho by multiplying rho with another function which takes care of what it needs to take care. Of. So it needs to make this function be in this space. And this is what is called oscillating test function. And here, I mean, one sees why capacity plays a role. Indeed, so what do I need for uh, this oscillating test function W epsilon? So first property, my function needs to vanish on the host. So W epsilon needs to be zero. Second property, my transformation needs to be a correction, right? So it needs to allow me to say that if I now send epsilon to zero, I need to recover my original test function. So my oscillating test function should converge to one quickly. And now you already start seeing a connection with the capacity. Because remember the capacity in some sense, let's say this was my set, I'm doing it into B in some sense A, and this was my set B. The capacity was something that needed to be at least one here and then go down and go down in a nice way in order to minimize the Dirich energy. So here I'm doing something similar because here I'm asking that I have a function which is zero in the holes, but then it becomes pretty much, I mean, one outside of the hole because otherwise it doesn't converge to one. So in some sense, it would be like the opposite kind. I mean, it would be like zero here and one here. So one minus the capacity, but still is this kind of approximation or way of uh, constructing a function. So here you already see the connection with the capacity. And then there is one last thing. Of course, I could say, okay, I, I, I'm fine with these two properties. I try to, this already allows me to say that it is admissible. I test the problem with this. So what does it, what happens? So if I test, I hope that it's visible in the screen. So I test with rho epsilon. So I get something of this form. So this term is nice because this is a fixed, this is fixed, this converges weakly. So no problem with that. Now here I have a product. So I will have two terms. And then I have the other one. So this term is nice because here I have weak convergence from here. And here I have strong convergence because I was assuming that this converges weakly in H1. Yes. So this converges to what? Well, to basically this. So the weak formulation for the Laplacian. And then I have another term. And this is the term which is painful in some sense. 
Why? Because here I have gradients and here I have gradients. So I have weak convergence and weak convergence. If I can't pass to the next. So I need to do something more. Now, uh, here where it gets technical. So I'm happy to answer questions, but for now, let me just say that here you need to assume something more on the W epsilon. And let's say morally speaking, you need to ask in some sense that the L2 norm of your gradient approximate the capacity. So the measure in some sense. So if you take the L2 norm of the oscillating phase function in A, this converges basically to a constant, which is the constant that will appear in the limit problem. So in other words, the additional assumption here is telling you, because if you see here, I'm just asking zero and one. I'm not really asking you that it's really the capacitary function. I'm not really in, ensuring that I minimize in some sense the energy, the Dirichlet energy. This additional, morally speaking at least, this additional condition is the one, sorry, that tells me that the function that I need to use and construct is very close to a capacitary function for the case. So if I ask the function for the whole stream, you know, this is somewhere measuring the capacity for uh, uh, D minus H epsilon in D. I'm saying that basically I want to, yes, in other words, yes. That is you see, if you see here, so I'm, I'm looking at the integral in A of this and here. So this is like vanishing in the holes. So in some sense, the, the Dirichlet energy in A outside the holes. So it's very similar to the minimization problem that you have for the capacity. Okay, so your statement here is for every phi compactly supported smooth D, there exists a W phi this equation in such a way that W times rho is phi. No, if I if I construct a function which I call oscillating this function, right, which satisfies these three hypotheses, then I have homogenization. Why? Because I can take any function here. So this is independent from rho. I take any rho here. I multiply rho by W epsilon. And I test the equation for U epsilon with this test function, which is now admissible. These properties here are the three properties which allow me to pass to the limit in all the terms. And what you will see indeed is that this will converge exactly to the term mu this will be the term which gives you the capacitor or the additional term. So before finishing, let me, okay, let me just uh, tell you a bit more about the random case because this is like something which doesn't have to do with the random case. This is just the, let's say, abstract framework or the way or the strategy in which you prove homogenization. So of course, everything now boils down to proving the existence of this oscillating test function. In the periodic case, that's kind of easy in some sense, or at least it has been done, because you can reduce yourself to the cell problem. So how do you construct W epsilon? Basically, like this. So this is, these are your holes. Now you take a cell here. So this is size epsilon. This is epsilon to the three. And what you do is basically you take here the capacitary function. So you construct W epsilon by constructing it in the cell and then extending it periodically. And this is basically the capacitary function for, uh, let me call this uh, T epsilon and the big ball, so this one is order epsilon, the epsilon. So this is for T epsilon in the epsilon. For capacitor function, you have a function which equals to one of the 
uh, inclusion, but you, you probably touched on that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so in other words, it's this, right? Because in some sense, for a regular set, the capacitary function is the harmonic extension. So it's a function which is one. Why one. don't you take a capacitive function for the full space? Because uh, it does not really matter what happens in that. It's, it's, it's almost one of the other sets. So yeah. Because it's harder to construct. It's harder to construct explicitly. And when you want to check this particular property here, it's much more painful. So this is why you, it's easier to, to reduce to the cell. Now, a few words about the, period, uh, the random case. So the random case, let me go here. Let's say the, the idea on how to treat the random case is very intuitive. It's just, I want to divide my set into a part of holes where things go nicely and a part of, hole, of, of, of holes where things are more problematic. So I called it like, let's say H epsilon good and H epsilon bad. How do I pick them? Of course, it's a bit more technical than this, but morally speaking, it's just, this is just the set basically where the length scales are respected. So distance of order epsilon, radii of order epsilon to the two. So this is the set where you are basically like this periodic case. You are not, of course, periodic, but the distances are nice. So you can define some kind of cells. So this is now the bed set. Now the bed set is of course where I have clusters, where things can get too crowded. Morally speaking, these are where your radii overlap. So morally speaking, the main condition which defines this set is where the radii is at least of order the distance. So in other words, where the radii are very big. Or the distance is too small. Or the distance is too small, yes. But um, since I'm considering, uh, okay, let's hope it doesn't fall. Let me try to. No big deal. Yeah. No, but the problem is that I'm like making it very dirty. Sorry. Uh, the main singularity is in the fact that the radii have very low integrity because the, um, the centers are Poisson distributed or like randomly distributed, but with a very nice distribution. So it's true that also radii can get too close, but it's in a much better way. So this is the main problem. Okay, so how do you deal with this? So quickly, so this would mean that now if I, instead of having this, I would have a different geometry. I might have something like this, here, this, this. So let's say that this is bad and this is good. So the bad part could be some this part, for instance, right? So places where I have clusters. And the idea, I mean, so what you want to do in some sense, more or less. To, to, to construct a nice function where you have nice things in a way pretty similar to this one because holes are very well separated and then try implicitly to deal with the capacity of the clusters. How? So you want to construct not only these clusters but you want to construct, so or better, you want to choose the clusters in such a way that you can so that they are well separated from the good holes. So in the sense that you can find, let's say, a what is called a safety layer. I would call it the epsilon. So this the epsilon contains the bad holes, right? They are inside. Why is it a safety layer? Well, 
it's maybe the epsilon is not a good sorry let me call it s epsilon so the distance of this safety layer from the good holes is still of order epsilon. So it still separates a lot the two sets. So it should be like tight enough, but not too tight in the following sense. If I take, I hope it's visible, if I take the capacity of the bad holes in the safety layer, so only the capacity of this set inside this set, this scales like the capacity of the bad holes in the full R3. So this is not too tight. So what I can control basically the capacity of this in this in the same way I control this capacity here. So why is this nice? Very quickly. So one thing that one can do to construct the W epsilon is to say I construct it like in the periodic case in the good holes. And then here, I just define it as the one minus the capacitary function. So in other words, I consider this guy here. Maybe it doesn't have a minimizer, but it has something which is close to being minimizing. And I take that function as my oscillating test function or one minus that function. Why is that nice? Well, because if I do this and then I will finish, sorry about running this out of time. So I define, so what I just said is I define as W epsilon as in periodic in in H epsilon good. And then I define it as one minus, let's call it the epsilon. So this is the basically the arc the minimizer for this capacity. On uh, So the capacity is defined such that it's zero on the boundary on the on this on the boundary of this. One minus this means that it's one. So it attaches in a nice way. Because that's also one outside of the pose. Why is this nice? Because I can control. So when I will have to, for instance, check this, I will have to control some L2 norms of gradients. So I will want to control. And this is the final, really the final thing. So I will want to control, in some sense, the L2 norm of this V epsilon. But I know that this is the capacity, or this is kind of the capacity. Now I use the properties of the safety layer. So this is also kind of the capacity of the bell holes in our system. So why is this nice? Because now I have that I have the capacity of a union of balls. And how do I pick them? So these are the ones for which the radii are big. Now I use only subadditivity. I bump from above the sum with the sum, let's say, of each of these holes. But what are they? These are the rows for which I have this lower bound. And I'm summing over z. Now I use the, the strong load large numbers. This converges because that's maybe let me. I will write it here again. Okay. Yeah. If, if you wish, you can swap the boards. No, but that's the, the last thing. So I have something like this. If this wasn't here, sorry, there is an answer. I would know that this converges to the first moment of this. But I'm putting something which goes to infinity. 
So it's like when I have an L1 function and I'm putting like a lower bound, which is going to infinity. This is going to zero, almost sure. So no matter how exactly the clusters are, if I do that construction, I can use immediately subadditivity and get rid of the problem without having to really study the geology. And that's the main way, at least for the Laplacian, not for Stokes, to solve the problem of the clustering. And with this, I thank you everyone and sorry for running slightly out of time. Thank you very much. 58, so you're perfectly oh. on time. <laughs> <laughs> so questions either from a live audience or from the people connecting online. You can just raise your hands or write something in the chat or just speak out. Hopefully we'll hear you. So when you, when you choose a safety layer, you have to choose it to have these certain properties. Is it clear that that's always possible? Uh, no, that's the technical painful part in the sense that you need to use. So let's say um, it's not so hard to, to deal with the fact with the problem where the holes become too close. Again, because for some point processes are very well behaved. It's true that the distance is not exactly epsilon, but you can show that it's very small the probability that they become too close. Uh, the part, so treating the, the, the part of the chains becomes much, much harder. And that's the, where you need like really like some constructive way of defining this uh, boundary layer and it's the part which gets technical so it's not immediate it's not easy to, to, to uh, not even to define it in some uh, and this is in three dimensions I yes you spoke about using three dimensions does it get easier or harder when you go up in dimensions so it's no it works in any dimension oh. at least three uh, so the scalings would be d minus two epsilon in, uh, for a general dimension of this three. Not possible in two dimensions. In two dimensions, no, because your cap the capacity uh, it scales logarithmically. So in that case, you should take exponential norm. So it, you can do something, but it's it's a kind of totally different, you know, like scaling. In this part, sir, do you... <clears throat> With the bus, sir, do you actually need to use these capacitive functions uh, can't can't you use instead a simple cutoff functions which are zero on these inclusions and one outside no, certain that doesn't allow you to, to control easily but but uh, it's it's just the number of such but uh, the the overall uh, volume of that but set is quite small so wouldn't it, you you tried or you yes. But okay, so. yeah, I mean, one should like start doing the calculation, but it's definitely not the, the volume, which is the one which appears in terms of scalings. So you're not, it's not immediate and it's not, it doesn't work somehow to just do a cutoff there. Or even, you know, this kind of round cutoff or yeah, you yeah. really need a bit more. You need to control, I mean, you need, because that's the quantity which tells you what happens. And, uh, and that's what you want to control. And with that third step on, on the bottom of the uh, upper white, uh, blackboard, yes. so uh, you have this convergence for the uh, norm of the gra uh, gradients, right? But uh, you wrap it up together with uh, the gradient of the solution. And do I guess correct that you perform an integration by parts there? Yeah. And use the properties of uh, solutions for capacitor problems, something like that. So no, I think yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So that's the moral property. The real property is this one. So the real property is really just what I need in order to control that integral. So I want that uh, for every sequence. H1 zero the epsilon, uh, which converges to something in H1 zero. 
They are not the epsilon is this. Uh, for every, so that, that's exactly the condition that you need. So whenever you have a sequence, which is weakly converging in H1, and if you take a general test function rho, and you look at this duality here, so, So you take the Laplacian of the W epsilon and that's duality. Let's see if I manage to. You catch me small bit. So this quantity here needs to converge to V. Row you or your concept the new that appears. So that's exactly the, and that's what you mean there in the sense that when you have that integral, you need to integrate by part. So the integral that you had, let me put it here. So you had an integral of this form, right? So that was the term that you did. And then if you integrate by parts, you want to put this here. So you will get like one part where you don't have a problem. Because again, sorry, U epsilon, red W epsilon. And that goes to zero because that's going to zero weekly. That's uh, that's going to H zero strong. Yeah. And then you have this term here, basically, where you have U epsilon instead of this. So you want a general condition on this. This is why when you ask me about whether, why not defining a more general capacitary function, uh, I could like make the proof work because here, as you see, at least, let's say, the way one can prove it is by saying, okay, I look at this Laplacians, and I look at this, I mean, these are coming from this cell problem, so these have measures which are concentrated on spheres, and I can play with those. If I define it in a more general way, then it, it's, it's much harder to control the effect of the action of the Laplacian. Are there more questions? So I, I have another one. If uh, okay, so uh, one more question, I guess. Uh, uh, you, you were talking about post on point process, but do, do, uh, is, it, is it the setting you considered this problem in, or you have more general assumptions on, on your probability space? And, and uh, so, how will you generate, generate your holes? So, in general, we, we generate it in that form. Or, I mean, in principle, of course, you can extend to other shapes, but the way we, we, we construct it is you take a certain, uh, or, so it's what is called marked point process. So you take a point process, Poisson, you can take Materian, I mean, uh, point processes where you basically have a good enough decay of correlations, mm -hmm. uh, which allows you to control and to tell you that I see. Do not and, and do you walk uh, do you walk in this abstract probability no. uh, space at, not, not at all so no. oh, everything like me it's all just measures on your physical it's, space and i would say it's uh, <coughs> it's similar especially for stokes just one small comment for stokes subadditivity does not work anymore mm -hmm. because you have a divergent state constraint so this inequality here doesn't work so things get more painful because you cannot dismiss immediately the clusters. And there you really need to construct, to understand a bit more the nature of these clusters. So it's more similar to percolation, continuum percolation techniques than the defining probability space using stationarity and lifting. In, let's say, it's definitely not, I'm not saying that it doesn't work in that way. It's just that you have two scales here the epsilon and the, so the, the distance and the radii, 
So it's not so easy to just do the lifting and work in a general probability space because you have the dependence on epsilon also in that case again. So, so it would make things more complicated, but it might work as well, but we don't do it. Thank you. Cheers. Any questions from our online audience? Doesn't look like the case. So we have had a few questions. So let's move on to coffee and biscuits. So thank you very much again. Thanks.